everyone and welcome back to the Great Book of Grudges. My name is Nathan and it's finally time. Immortal Empires videos can now finally be released. So the first one obviously was going to be the Warriors of Chaos rework. So as you can see I've turned off access to the DLC meaning that everything on this video that you will see will be what's coming in the Warriors of Chaos rework. So if you end up not buying the Champions of Chaos DLC you'll still have this coming to Bellacor, to Sigvald, Kolek and Archeon. This pretty much means that you won't get access to the majority of the new units as some of them do come in an FLC pack but you still have a lot to do and well let's talk about it. For the purpose of this video I'll mostly be using footage of Archeon the Everchosen as well it kind of makes sense considering that he's the big bad in the Chaos roster but we will look towards the other two. I'm going to leave Bellacore to his own video as his playstyle is quite different and it kind of just makes sense just to give him his own spotlight. That being said there is a lot to talk about so yeah let's go. So Archeon as you can see starts in the Northern Chaos Waste which has already been announced this is a territory which is mostly full of allies as your faction kind of benefits from being around loads of other chaos factions. There is the case too that Boris Ursus is around this location too and he is probably going to be your biggest adversary at the beginning of your campaign. However, if you can plan well enough you won't have too much of a problem and the campaign begins as expected. You start off without a settlement, you have to go capture a dark fortress and all that type of stuff. But we do have to talk about faction effects and all that other stuff before we get into that. Archeon's faction effects are known as Ever Chosen and this has the following benefits. Maximum active gifts plus one for Gifts of Chaos Undivided. We'll be getting into that a little bit later. Research rate plus 10% per each vassalized faction. This is something that's going to be very beneficial to you, same as all the others, considering that you will be getting a lot of vassals as you progress for your campaign. Diplomatic relations plus 10 with Demons of Chaos, Warriors of Chaos, Beastmen and Norska for each vassalized faction. Again, like I said before, and souls plus 25 per turn form each vassal faction. Again, very, very important considering vassals. Out of all the standard Warriors of Chaos Lords, I would say that Archeon probably has the best effects. That's something that I have quite noticed. Whereas his own personal trait, known as Vessel, has the following benefits. Units gain plus 3% weapon and missile strength per rank achieved in Lord's Army, Quite useful considering that, you know, the Ever Chosen wants to hang around with the strongest of the bunch. All authority plus one for Lord's Army. Authority is a new mechanic that you will be getting explained later on in this video. And finally, Ward Safe plus 5% for Lord's Army. So your troops are going to be a lot stronger and you're not going to have too much of an issue when it comes to this. Seeing as getting ranks is quite important and there's a few skills which will actually help with that, you won't have too much issue. So not much is really changing when it comes to his skills, especially his skill line. It's just a few benefits here and there, I'm scrolling right over them. Making your troops stronger, reducing upkeep for certain units, even the upgrade costs for undivided units, this is something that we'll go over soon. So. It works out very, very well, and it's very still reminiscent of that of what we have in Warhammer 2, barring all the new features. What has quite changed for Archeon, which is actually quite interesting, is his spells. He used to have access to just the Law of Fire, but now he actually has a mix of the older laws, which kind of represents him in a better aspect from the lore, where he still knows how to cast a variety of different spells. And you actually have a pretty good amount, so yeah, you've got a little bit of a mix here and there, which is always quite nice. What we will do now is talk about the other lords before we start talking about anything else. Codex Anita, as you can see, starts with a wide variety of different monsters. This is, well, a bit more lore friendly, a lot of Dragon Ogres too, which is going to be quite fun considering that you're around Grimgore. This faction effect is known as Herald of the Tempest and has the following benefits. Maximum active gifts plus one for gifts of chaos undivided. Dark Fortress Settlement Buildings grant additional Dragon Ogre Warband recruitment capacity. This is going to be quite cool if you want to have a proper theme about just having those Dragon Ogres and just going with a full I'm going to just bring the biggest, baddest I can find type of thing. And Empowered by Worship, this is a really interesting one. Kolek gains plus 5% weapon strength, mass and armor for each currently vassalized faction. Meaning that the more vassals you get, he is going to get really, really strong. Keep in mind with these types of things, there is generally a limit as to how strong you can get. But if you do max out your stats, you're going to be hitting hard. You're going to be hitting very, very hard. His own personal trait is known as Mountain God and has the following benefits. Souls cost minus 25% for Carnage Incarnate, which is a Gift of Chaos. 
upkeep minus 25% for Dragon Ogres and Dragon Ogre Shagoth units for Lord's Army. Very, very useful considering that upkeep, uh, it's a bit of an issue. Early on, money is going to be quite hard to find, but you'll see that later on. And finally, Missile Resistance, 10% for Chaos Monstrous Infantry and Monster Units for Lord's Army. Obviously very useful too. We also have a quick look at all his skills. These have been changed a little bit, but it's the usual stuff. Some bonuses here and there. Interestingly enough, making him demonic. Archeon can also get that too, which is um, bizarre for me at least. It's something that uh, is just a bit odd, especially for Dragon Ogres because they're not really demons. But there's good bonuses all around and the character is going to be able to do a lot of damage without these bonuses. So adding him extra, it's, uh, it's kind of scary. I've seen him do a lot of wonderful things and by wonderful I mean horrifying. If we move on to Prince Sigvald the Magnificent, he starts around, well, very close to the Palace of Princes, which is quite a law-friendly star position, with a pretty decent army. Four units of Chaos Warriors, two units of Marauders, a Chariot, obviously some Hellstriders, and some Spawn of Sunesh. Generally not too bad, and you're going to need it considering that, you know, going to fight the Dark Elves, you're going to want as much extra troops as possible, plus keep in mind that your armor will not do so well against them. It's very important to note that. But as usual, like all the others, you'll start outside a settlement. You'll have to take that, and that is your first Dark Fortress. Sigvald's faction effects are known as Scion of Sinesh and have the following benefits. Souls cost minus 25% for all gifts of Sinesh. Vassals gain immune to psychology and spread Sinesh corruption. Can seduce units. Applies and benefits from seductive influence and gifts of Sinesh. So essentially, while Sigvald is an undivided character for all intents and purposes and has access to all five rosters, he does lean towards the Sineshi side. This means that if you do have the DLC, you're going to benefit from this a bit more. Sigvald's own personal personal trait known as Supreme Vanity has the following benefits. Character experience plus 10%, which is quite helpful if you're trying to dedicate your characters or even have them become demon princes. Then, Sinesh Corruption plus 4 for local province, again, kinda helps out, as corruption kinda is tied to how recruitment works too. And finally, Speed plus 15% for Marauders of Sinesh, Chaos Warriors of Sinesh, and Chosen of Sinesh units, Lord's Army. Keep in mind that the Chosen and one of the units of Chaos Warriors of Sinesh, and even the Marauders, are linked up to the DLC, which uh, is a bit of an odd thing, but you do have access to one unit of Chaos Warriors of Sinesh, which comes as the FLC, those are the ones with the Hell Scourges and are objectively the best ones anyway. And obviously he does also have his unique skill line which has been changed ever so slightly. I've been going through them and it also makes him demonic. Uh, you get some more authority that is Sinesh focus. Loads of buffs all around. This stuff is, well, kind of useful and stuff that you should really be focusing on. One thing that I have been doing is when I'm close to the level to start getting the first one, I'll actually start saving skill points so I can just get them all at once. Because it makes it a lot faster and it makes your lord a lot stronger, so it's kind of worth it. Anyways, let's jump into authority as this is something really, really important as it affects your campaign, what units you'll be having in your armies, and just various different benefits. So authority is gained through a variety of different ways, either by skill points, even some tech, and the more authority you have, you will start to get some benefits. So as you can see here, when you have a 41, you get basic bonuses here. So casualty replenishment, extra upkeep reduction, recruitment cost reduction, and even warband upgrade costs. So all in all, it's really good. You can get it all the way up to rank 10. Now, the fact is that you can go to the minuses, keep that in mind. But if you're going into minuses with certain characters, it's mostly because you aren't using those units. Like, say, for example, if I'm using Sigvald, I'm usually going into minuses with Corn Authority, but I'm not really using Corn units with Sigvald, so it doesn't really matter anyway. What I would suggest here is that if you are higher on certain authority, then you'll want to focus on those units. So, say, for example, Archeon, who is on authority 4, you'll want to focus more on undivided units as they will be cheaper for you to use overall. And money is a very strange thing with the Warriors of Chaos because uh, a lot of stuff are very expensive. However, you won't tend to notice that later into campaign. So, the technology tree has radically changed. As you can see, it's no longer that god-awful one from Warhammer 1 and Warhammer 2. Instead, it's actually quite large. And I'm going to be talking about it as we scroll through them. You can pause wherever you wish. Uh, I'll have a file 
later around the week, just kind of outlining everything in case you guys are more curious about that. But it's divided into five separate parts. The middle, which is all mostly focused around Chaos Undivided, then there's obviously to the left and the right, which is Korn and Nurgle on the left-hand side, Zanesh and Zinch on the other side, and really, there's a lot to go through it. It is advised to kind of take your time, as a lot of them kind of are very important, especially if you want to upgrade Warriors to Chosen, for example, you need specific tech. There's some general cool ones, like for example, just giving fear to aspiring champions and chosen units, uh, more authority, extra gifts, which the gifts themselves we'll get to a bit later, and they're very, very useful. So, yeah, it's about taking your time. It's not about going down one specific section, as, well, it's probably best just to have some fun, go through different areas. You can easily just go and beeline for one section if you want to focus on like corn units and all that type of stuff. But these are your undivided factions, so you might as well have fun with this. It's better this way just to go through all the different bonuses, get the ones which more align with your playstyle. And the great thing is that since there's so many ways that you can go, it kind of adds to replayability, like for example, when I play a Sigvald, I do generally go for the Suneshi section, though playing a Sigvald actually has a massive benefit that a few of the Suneshi techs in this tree will actually be unlocked already, because, well, you know, he's a Sunesh faction but playing more as an undivided route. Keep in mind that you'll also see the new tech trees fully, as you've already seen a few of them, for the other Chaos Champions from the Champions of Chaos later on. But as it stands right now, there is so much with this, I actually find it really fun. I've been playing a lot with Archeon, mostly because, like, you know, he's the big bad, and he's generally a lot stronger. But these techs can kind of level out anyone, depending on what you go for. Going for the god-specific ones will actually help quite a bit if you want to get more demons in your army or the specific god. And trust me, kind of mixing up warriors and demons is really, really fun. Right, we've talked about the administration style way too much. Let's just jump right into the actual campaign. So, we need to get Dark Fortresses. Those are our main settlements. And at the start of your campaign, you won't even start with a settlement. In fact, you'll just actually have to get into a fight, which can be a little bit tough depending on how you play and what your difficulty is. But it's something that kind of is very rewarding, as the Dark Fortresses themselves are your bread and butter. So you get in there, you take it over, then you can choose to sack it, raise it, even at some points give it to an ally, but what you want to do is occupy and vassalize. As Dark Fortresses, they're not that many, plus you get your bonuses there, as you know that vassalization is very important. It's also linked up, so what you can see from the Dark Fortress is it's got a logo to the side, kind of focusing on a um, minor Chaos Tribe of Norskins, and those are the ones that will be your main vassals. Some of them have built fast empires, which are no longer in their control, so you'll want to regain those territories for them. The faction on screen is the Call Tribe, which actually has quite a lot of territories, and you can make them quite strong. It's just the case of going there and just taking the lands. I will make a very important note here, so this clip will last a little bit longer. When you vassalize, you automatically vassalize that given faction. They could have loads of territories, or even just a few. Keep in mind that these minor factions can also be revived if they're fully gone and you end up taking the Dark Fortress, so don't worry about that. Just in case you want more and more allies, I always kind of find that having as many of the vassals that you possibly can as the Warriors of Chaos kind of does help too. Right, let's talk about construction because this is very, very important. So generally, you only really want these settlements which are Dark Fortresses as those are your main cities. These ones, you can get access to infrastructure buildings with quite a lot of money, help with a little bit of extra recruitment, even some bonuses overall, you can see all that there. Really, the infrastructure one, the treasure house, is very, very important, trust me on this. And yeah, it's just kind of focus on these. These have all your big things. This is where you'll be starting your armies. This is where you'll be pretty much planning all your invasions, and they're the most beneficial to you. Whereas the other settlements, you still can get them, but they're more in the style of outposts, so they can't actually get to tier 2, tier 3, they can only have one building, they're actually very, very weak. And, well, let's be honest, you can give the minor settlements to your allies, your vassals, and they can then offer more tribute to you, so it kind of works out. The way the Warriors of Chaos work now is not so much empire building, rather 
kind of empire destroying. Now recruitment is also radically different as you can see here. It works as a warband recruitment. So you'll be instantly getting these units but you won't be able to just like sit there for a few turns and get armies as you can see here. You need to be in certain locations for certain units like say for example the marauders need to be found in frozen climates or areas with high chaos undivided corruption. And that gives them a bit of an RNG chance more so when there's more corruption and all that type of stuff to be able to be available the next turn. And there's ways to improve on this, get better units as time progresses. So it's not just this, don't worry. You will be able to outright recruit, say, for example, a Chaos Giant and all those things. This later gets expanded upon because through that recruitment, even though you've gotten Marauders through that, then you can then upgrade them, as you can see here, where right now you've only really got access to the main stuff, so that's the undivided stuff. Anything else is pretty much tied to a DLC, so I don't have access to it. But you'll need to rank up your Marauders to either turn them into Forsaken or Chaos Warriors. Then afterwards you can turn them into Chaos Spawn, Chosen, or maybe even Chaos Knights, Aspiring Champions. It all very much depends on where you want to go and obviously the limitations that are placed on that. But this stuff is actually pretty cool as it gives you a sense of keeping your units as much as possible rather than just I'm going to outright recruit this, I'm going to outright recruit that, and so on and so forth. Now this is still very important to note that a lot of the units from the base game of Warhammer 3 will also be available to you. These are the Chaos Warriors of Corn, some stuff from the FLC, pretty much all the stuff that you can kind of expect. And... This will not have the same tree if you do not have the DLC. So right now I have the DLC turned off. So I can turn my Chaos Warriors into Chaos Warriors of Corn or even Chaos Warriors of Zinch with Halberds as those were an FLC unit. I will need a technology for that though. But if you want the full experience, you're going to need the DLC. Now that's not saying that you should buy the DLC or not. You can hear my thoughts on the DLC when the appropriate videos do drop at the given embargo. It's just something to take into account that you won't have the full roster, but you still have a decent amount. You still get the Doom Knights, for example, which I really am a big fan of. So those ones are quite cool. You do get the uh, Hellstriders, which, you know, were part of the vanilla 8th edition roster for the Warriors of Chaos on the tabletop. So you still have access to those. It kind of lets you test out the style before you actually jump into the DLC too. But if you don't have the DLC and if you're wondering what the Hell Cannon was... Well, it's not just the only units that you can have, as you can get access to quite a lot of demons through the gifted units function. This is where you'll also be getting the Chaos War Shrine, by the way, but uh, the DLC is off, so you won't be able to see it. So, this is another format as to how to kind of fluff up your roster. If you want demons around with your units, if you want to go with the whole Hordes of Chaos style army from the tabletop, then this is the best way for you. And obviously, since this is part of the base game, you'll have access to it. You don't need to own something else because you already own this. And you'll unlock your demons through this system, which is known as Gifts of Chaos. So we're not going to talk about everything because we're going to be going into lots more detail through all the individual Champions of Chaos videos as it kind of makes sense for that. I just also realized that the eye in the Gifts of Chaos for Undivided just kind of follows you and it's kind of creepy. But how this works is if you want Furies, if you want bonuses, this is something which kind of makes your faction a lot stronger. At the beginning, you only have access to undivided gifts as an undivided faction. And as you start progressing, as you start doing your tech and so on, you'll start get more. And it's really just different bonuses. It can give fear for your units, increased regeneration, increased this, that, or the other. Basically, pretty much whatever is being listed as we scroll down. This is just the undivided section. And also, in the undivided section, you'll be able to get your hands on Chaos Furies, because they're an undivided demon. But if you end up going through a route, so say, for example, you unlock the Zinchian tree, that's how you'll be able to get access to horrors and, well, pretty much any other Zinchian demon that you might want to get your hands on. So... It's a pretty interesting thing. You'll need souls. Souls are a very valuable resource here as they do cost to activate and then you'll get a unit and then after a few turns they'll kind of just refresh and give you a new one and so on. But it, there is an upkeep and the upkeep is important. It, souls are one of these things where you'll need to keep an eye on. Early on, it's going to be kind of annoying to get your hands on souls very very early on at least but as you progress as you do more battles because battles are the best way to get souls there are other ways like say for example random events but really this is a chaos faction you're going to be going in you're going to be causing damage you're going to be destroying anything in your path you'll really not notice the lack of souls really but it is important to make sure that you don't have too many gifts active at the beginning especially if you want to dedicate some characters if you own the dlc or if you want to turn a character into demon prince as those cost souls too souls can be uh 
a bit of a commodity at that point. And again, you don't have to go directly for Zinch first. You can go for Corn if you want Cornate Demons. You can go for Sinesh if you want Sinesh Demons. It's really up to your playstyle, which I really like how this is done as it allows for replayability. Or it's just the case of if you want to go for Hordes of Chaos, like I said, you want a bit of mix, there you go. So this is an interesting mechanic with the Eye Opens. So every now and then as your campaign progresses, the Eye of the Gods, which tabletop fans will kind of have a little bit of nostalgic feel there, will activate and this gives you a chance at random kind of bonuses. So it can be control, it can be extra replenishment, it could be souls, it could literally be anything. And really this is... A nice throwback to a very much loved and sometimes hated mechanic from the tabletop in 8th. So it's actually really nice to see that here. I did have a uh, nice nostalgic smile when I saw it for the first time and that's always really fun. So what I want to do right now is give my thoughts regarding on the Warriors of Chaos rework. Keep in mind this is not a review and these thoughts are clearly only based on the Warriors of Chaos rework with no mention whatsoever regarding the um, Champions of Chaos DLC which will also launch alongside this if you purchase the DLC, of course. So, the Warriors of Chaos, as we are aware, were one of the worst factions in the Warhammer series to play. The fact is that even mods had a hard time kind of making them enjoyable, and it's been something that people have been requesting and have been complaining about for a long time to get their fix. The Warriors of Chaos have now got a massive update which drastically and completely changes their playstyle as, well, not only are they no longer hordes, but they've got access to a... Horde-like style gameplay, very similar to that of a pseudo-horde, but even more advanced in a sense. It is definitely going to be a harder faction to get used to. The gameplay is definitely a lot harder, at least that's from my experience, and I've got a lot of experience with the Warhammer franchise, but I must say that it is definitely better, and it is in a right direction here, where the faction feels like a Warriors of Chaos faction. You're building up dark fortresses, you're getting loads of vassals which are acting as your servants, and they themselves are providing tribute to you, so you may then get larger and stronger armies. I'm a big fan of the fact that they used a lot of very similar mechanics to that of a Total War Saga Troy. That's actually something that I did say when Troy had that DLC, that the Amazon recruitment stuff, all that should have kind of been very similar to that of the Warriors of Chaos, and it looks like they've done that with their own interpretive spin, of course, because they can't just do a one-by-one -one translation. But all in all, I think that the Warriors of Chaos are in a much, much better place. Sigvald is fun, Kolek is fun, Archeon is fun. They've all got their own styling. Bellacor is also quite fun, but he's not being mentioned in this video because I feel like he deserves his own dedicated video. But keep in mind that this was the first ever race pack that got released for the Warhammer series. They were day one DLC, so it's taken a while to see them get a little bit better. This is definitely a step in the right direction. Reworks like this should be around this level, I must say. It's not so much of a chore now, but rather more of an experience where you're going through what I can say more of a law-friendly approach for a Chaos Warband, where you're struggling at the beginning, but then you're building yourself up, you're getting stronger and stronger and stronger to do a lot more damage. I was playing through a few campaigns and I was thinking, yeah, this actually feels how the Warriors of Chaos are interpreted in law, interpreted in tabletop, and I think that's actually a quite a good thing, because we want that. Yes, sometimes gameplay has to trump law, but law can actually make gameplay very, very good. So yeah, you've got access to this as soon as the patch drops. That means that if you don't buy Champions of Chaos, but you do have the Warriors of Chaos pack, all the stuff that you've seen in this video is available to you from the very, very beginning. And obviously Bellacore too, if you have this. But keep in mind that this is for Immortal Empires only, so these characters and Bellacore are not available in the Realm of Chaos map. I think I'm very able to say that it's very positive that reworks are getting better and better as the time progresses. We've seen that with the Wood Elves, and then the Beastmen, and now with the Warriors of Chaos. So future stuff, like say for example Norska, who very desperately needs a rework, there's definitely high hopes for Norska in the future. The Warriors of Chaos are in a very, very good place, and if you want to expand upon that more, soon enough I'll be able to start dropping videos on the Champions of Chaos, which will have access to loads of new units. Obviously, there's basically four rosters there, and that should 
give you a bit more to look for. But until then, let me know what you guys think about the Warriors of Chaos rework in the comments below. We'll start a bit of a discussion. There's a lot more to come out. This is just the first video in uh, a lot of videos that are going to be releasing until the actual release of everything. So, uh, yeah, there's going to be content. There's going to be content, guys. Also, keep in mind that I will also be streaming daily, twice a day, on twitch.tv slash the Great Book of Grudges. No spaces there. And that will be at the time that this video goes live. I should be streaming there on a Bellacore campaign. But we've got a lot more to showcase.